how many ears does Captain Kirk have? Tell me. Oh, no, I know this one. Wait, wait, wait. I got this one. Is it the left ear, right ear, and the, the wild frontier? Oh, no, that's the... Final fucking, frontier, you fucking dick. Final. The wild the, the, frontier. That, that, Captain that was, Kirk, welcome to the wild frontier. Who's the, uh, who's the fucking <laughs> the wild frontier back. guy? The fuck, I don't know. I can't remember. Um, what do you call a man with a nose and no body? Nobody knows. <laughs> oh, that was bad. Let's cut that one out. On that bombshell, let's get started because we have an absolute banger of an episode coming up, right Mitch? We do, man, we do indeed. Uh, so Nicholas, we've been talking a lot about getting guests on the show connected to whiskey but not necessarily directly connected within the whiskey world right and 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 we right. we want to get more people on the show that have got just really interesting lives interesting stories to tell but in the same way they're they're huge whiskey fans and we've definitely delivered on that today so ladies and gentlemen i would like to introduce you to an absolute legend within the adventure world someone who's become a good friend to me as well. Now, this gentleman has basically faced the perils of war zones as a former Royal Marine Commando sniper, and now he's gone to conquering the most dangerous terrains as an explorer and television presenter. I'd like to welcome to the show Mr. Aldo Kane, who has got a life story that is nothing short of captivating. He is a guy who climbs up pretty much every mountain in the world. You name it, he has done it. He's also a big whiskey fan. Aldo, welcome to the show, my man. How are you doing? Thank you very much for having me. Good to be here. Fantastic. Do like you like your wee hype section there, you know? Yeah. I was going to say, like, when people meet me in the street, they go, I thought you'd be much, much, much taller. Um, yeah. <laughs> I have to say, Alo, and I don't mean to be cheeky here, but when Mitch first told me this, he, 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 and he said it again in this introduction, he's like a Royal Marine Commando sniper, which made me think that you used to take shots with no underwear on. But what he really means was you were a sniper for the Royal Marine Commandos. Is that correct? That is correct. But I think that's also where going commando comes from. Um, <laughs> when you. Is it like if I'm going to the the jungle or wherever? Then I'm, you know, I don't wear boxers, so that must be where it comes from. Going commando. I hope so. Is, One is, less is thing that... to shit. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it part of the training, mate? Right, when you have to do that, like you're not allowed to wear underwear. That's uh, in the in the hand. I don't know. I I just came out of a, a jungle trip there just like a couple of days ago, and I got absolutely smashed by leeches, hundreds of them, and I thought I can't. I can't remember back to when I was a young Marine, but I definitely was going commando in the jungle and would have definitely got leeches on the old uh, Crown Jewels. Oh, like like a scene out of uh, Stand By Me. <laughs> 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 that classic. Great reference. There you go. Wait, there we'll you get, go. I want to get into some of these crazy stories with you, um, but you know, as uh, your, your journey from serving as a, a Royal Marine sniper to becoming an adventurer and television presenter it's a really inspiring story and you know i've been lucky enough to sit down and have a few whiskeys with you and chat about some of your your mad stories which we'll get into but you know what what really sparked this kind of interest in in adventure and and, and exploration with you i think i think it started basically when i was a young lad so scouts i was in the beavers my dad was a scout leader and I was kind of dragged along to all these camps and, and that sort of thing. And I very quickly formed an opinion growing up in the West Coast of Scotland that I didn't want to be doing a desk job. It was just pretty much, I, I literally couldn't have wanted anything further, you know, more opposite than, more polar opposite than than a desk job. And, and obviously not an academic. So it was, it was very clear that it was going to be the military. For a life of adventure, not 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 to go to war, basically, although that does come with the, the territory. So, yeah, so I basically joined up at 16, and it's, you know, one of the longest, hardest infantry training in the world. It's, you know, it's, it's hard, but I didn't really have anything to compare it to. So, I, I, you know, I kind of, you know, I found it difficult, but I, you know, it's not like I could go, oh, I wish, you know, I was back doing my mechanic job where I was getting paid X amount a month. 
you know, because I was a paper boy and a milk boy. So I was, you know, I was getting paid 50 quid a month. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> even even my 200 quid a month wage in the Marines was was better than what I was getting. So so that I think that's what what sparked it. You know, you get into the Marines and then you you hang out with with cool people doing some some very cool cool jobs around the world and and that and it kind of then becomes addictive after that and on on that note so like i mean just for for people people out there who, who maybe haven't seen you before or had i mean you're, you're literally the most interesting man in the world like <laughs> when i when i started reading your bio but like what's your background like obviously you sound like a west coaster but born and raised where like what, what was like growing up yeah i grew up in winning well i started my life in east Kilbride, so it was newtown up until i was about 10 and then parents moved down to ayrshire and down to co-winning yep and they're they're paramedics so they were sort of moved down to uh basically following the work at that point so went to i guess went to co-winning academy there and and i didn't spend a huge amount of time there you know because i i we got there when i was 10 11 i think and i'd left you know by the time i was 16 i was already past my entrance exams for the marines and you know it was it was my training ground really you know yep. going across to aaron and and you know glencoe and places like that so west coast and then i joined up i spent 10 years in the in the royal marines up in Arbroath, down in plymouth and in, in taunton and then i left and i went back up to scotland went offshore for three or four years basically in the oil and gas industry yep. And then after that, got into doing TV safety work, which is kind of what I've been doing for the last 14, 15 years now. Wow. So, I mean, then obviously then a childhood in Ayrshire, you're used to the world's most hostile environments. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, what? <laughs> and then obviously being in, the, in, in, in you know, <laughs> that your, your marine career, like, can you recount any, like, what's the most intense or memorable experience you had during, you know, those expedition years and, and kind of traveling the world during that time? The most hostile and hardcore was probably walking to school in the morning <laughs> uh, never turned up with your lunch money did you you never, never turned up <laughs> uh so no but i um yeah I, I basically joined at 16 and then you know you, you're still you're too young actually to deploy operationally until you're 18 so by the time you pass all your training you know i was only 17 i still had another year best part of a year before I could deploy went to Northern Ireland which was super strange because it's so similar to where I grew up I mean it's literally like the exact same streets yeah so it was that was super weird and then from there went traveled around the world basically you you, you kind of become an expert in in you spend like six months working in jungles and you become an expert at jungle operations and then you deploy to Norway or you go to the mountains or you you know and you become an expert in these different areas and then you just spend the rest of your time rotating through essentially you know doing some very very cool jobs we are the Royal Marine commandos are, are basically sea soldiers you know we're, we're commandos we we're part of the navy much to lots of people's uh fun and jibing but um you know, so we, we deploy on ships. I spent a year on HMS Fearless back in the day in 1997. And I think that was the first time I really liked a trap. We sailed around the world, literally around the world on HMS Fearless. And I think, you know, I was 19 then. Wow. And that was that was just like, wow, eyes open, blinkers removed. And um, and that's pretty much where I started getting the bug for, for travel. Brilliant. Very cool, mate. And and you know the the thing that brought us both together was whiskey, right? We're going to chat about that in in a second. But I want to know, like, you you take bottles of whiskey on all your adventures with you now. How did that come into play? How, what was your first experience of drinking whiskey, and what did you start drinking? It's a good question. I've I've always done it um, almost on every single expedition I've been on that I can remember, you know, and I've done. I've probably done eight or nine this year um, and the same for the last 10 or 15 years. You know, it, it's just, you know, you look back to the old days when, when people like Shackleton were heading off on their adventures, you know, they were being outfitted on their boats with, 
with crates and crates of of whiskey, purely medicinal, obviously. Um, <laughs> but it, it kind of, you know, in my line of work doing hardcore expeditions, it kind of goes hand in hand. It's it's what you do at the end of a day or a long, tough section of something, or at the end of you know an achievement. And it's it's something that that I've only started really understanding recently about what it actually means. And it's not about the whiskey, but it's about belonging and it's about a sense of camaraderie. And that is uh, now we know through science-based research is one of the most fundamental parts of human life is is belonging, not just fitting in because because fitting in is superficial and can lead to all sorts of things going wrong in your life. But actual belonging is something that's that's absolute key in for mental health, physical health, for emotional health. And I find, you know, for me personally, that is about being with mates, doing hardcore things, and then celebrating the small wins or celebrating the losses. But all of it is about camaraderie. It's about belonging. It's about brotherhood. You know, the Marines was obviously all male so it was about brotherhood and it's actually kind of what i get in tv expeditions now is you know it sounds diametrically opposed to being a commando but it's small teams operating in extreme remote hostile locations very well trained with with usually a single goal in mind so it's actually pretty similar but um i guess that my first to answer your question my my first taste of whiskey was it was in Aaron and it was in a, a, a pub there around in Loch Ranza, if I can remember it. And we'd been cycling around it. I was still in the scouts at the time and just about to join up. So it was a bit of a naughty one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice. You're just about to have this pub's license revoked, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I look, uh, Obviously I looked much older than I do now. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I it was actually on a, it was basically on a, a cycling and camping trip. So I guess my, you know, my, my taste and subsequent drinking of whiskey has never really been an indoor thing. It's never been, it's never been really in pubs and it's never really been in, in the house. It's usually always outside um, or doing one of these adventures um, for me. It's, it's so funny you say that because you know, being outdoors and the project that we worked on and, and the way we connected was very much with that, with Wildmore that we've been chatting about on the show a couple of times now. So our listeners here are very aware about the whiskey, but, you know, it's so cool to see that you've turned essentially your passion on both fronts with regards to adventure and now whiskey into something that, that pays the bills essentially, right? <laughs> it's always nice <laughs> if you can do that and I, I, do you know what it's i've i work with very few brands because the job that i do requires me to use specific kit in specific environments and no one person provides or no one company provides all of the things that i need so i work with two or three people and they're usually very specific to the job and lifestyle that i have so it's this actually fitted pretty much perfectly into my into my court and it's and it's really exactly what we talked about with regards to expeditions belonging being part of something all of those things that that really actually make a difference are exactly what attracted me to Wildmore in the first place and actually the thought of getting to meet you lucky boy <laughs> <laughs> i paid you i paid him a lot of money to say that by the way no, but, it, but it was it was such a pleasure working with you and, and just to explain to our listeners what we did so when we did the launch we had a, a group of it was around about 15 people we had them at the bottom of the the, the mountain and we, we were going to do more of like a, a three-hour trek but the weather that day was pretty atrocious. You know, typical Scotland came out to play, right? <laughs> Our usual kind of conditions. But we did still take them up the mountain. We just didn't do the full hike. And it was really cool to have you on board for that because you were very much like, okay, everyone, you know, think about what you're about to do. When we get up there, you got up there, you, you talked to everyone about taking it all in, having that moment that we talked about, having the sort of camaraderie. And then we took them down and then we revealed wild more at, at the end of it, right? And, and, for for you, I was thinking like this is absolutely perfect. You're you're getting to combine 
the adventure part of it and drinking a whiskey afterwards, which is your kind of go-to thing. Did you, you enjoy that experience apart from the weather? I suppose the weather doesn't matter to you, right? You're in these conditions uh, all the time, right? I always love it. I live in Bristol, so it's it's always brilliant to get back home. So we did it. We we basically did it so people can work out where we were. Was up in the Allerdale Wilderness Reserve, so slap bang in the middle of the Highlands, and it was just stunning. Delivered on all fronts, but yeah, really, it was about it was about that to to show about that that sort of experience that you know and also a contemporary experience of being outdoors and what does that mean to be outside to be outside in 2024 how does connecting with people look like in 2024 so it was it was uh, it was just for me it was it was perfect it was combining being in the outdoors being in scotland and whiskey three very favorite pastimes and then we had that amazing dinner and uh, we won't talk about what we did after the dinner because there was some acrobatics involved and drink until about three in the morning. <laughs> as you do, as you do. As yeah. you do, that yeah. some hangover, yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so just, just to explain to everyone listening as well, what we had to do at seven o'clock in the morning was do a cold plunge. We had these whiskey casks all set up. So again, Aldo's talking to everyone about how you behave, I suppose, in this kind of environment of extreme cold and uh, we chatted before about, you know, me doing cold plunges. And then in front of everyone, Aldo's like, right, Mitch, you've done this before. Off you go, you know, get in there. So, yeah, no pressure. Get in the water. That, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, and, and that, you know, that's also part of, you know, being outdoors. Whenever I get a chance, I've just come back from a trip where I was away for three weeks and I washed every single day, twice a day in the river. You know, that that is about connection. That's about you know, whiskey is made with water. It's very specific water to specific areas of Scotland, isn't it? And, um, you know, that was, you know, this experience the guys got either in the river or in the, the cold plunge tubs that had water from the river. So it was all adding to that that bigger picture. Absolutely, mate, absolutely. It was kind of funny as well. I remember there was one of the, the people there that didn't really handle it too well, which was was pretty hilarious. But anyway, but, you know, back to your adventures, mate. You've, you know, you've, navigated some extreme conditions survived in remote areas so anyone who's listening that say they're an aspiring adventurer or individual looking to challenge themselves in the, in, in that sort of great outdoor environment what what do you have with regards to advice on that i think for me doing it as a job it was never about one becoming famous or or two you know building a profile it was about helping others and about providing service to others so that you know the job I do now is I look after people in extreme remote hostile locations who are in the the tv world so they're making television it just so happens that it's really interesting work and lots of travel so you know I didn't get into it specifically to get the what I have now from it the opportunities I got into it because I loved hard work I loved travel I loved the adventure and I was willing to do absolutely anything carry stuff for days on end or you know help people build rigs and trees it you know in in canopies in the jungle and so that's like a, at one extreme end of it there's not that many people in the world that do my job there's you know there's a select handful of people that that have the ability to do the technical side of the rigging, the diving, the trees, the caves, whatever that part is, but then also the people part of it. You know, when you're making, when you're working in extreme locations, it, you know, it's really all about the people. People can make an expedition or they can break it. Um, and so, you know, that that's at one end of it. But for people that just want to have more, I mean, if you look at, work-life balance you know uh, have we got it right are we spending more time at work and more time commuting and not enough time outside i'm big on i'm big on mental health and and sort of mental hygiene as in looking after yourself not i'm not talking about waiting till you've had a problem i'm talking about being proactive and for me being proactive about your mental health is about again belonging and it's about being outside in nature moving as in walking or running 
and and stimulating your parasympathetic nervous system so so you're stimulating the part of your body and brain your nervous system that allows you to be actually relaxed and for me that's outside it's it's walking the dog twice a day it's you know it's going for a run it's whatever it is so so it doesn't need to be for me this massive commitment and for people that want to just get started it just starts with taking a different route home from work getting off the tube early you know making a plan for once a month to go and do a thing a hill walk scotland when i lived up there i was i was in the mountains almost every weekend and and it's twofold it's very good for you mentally physically but also it builds up an ability to to be resilient you know in you know in your in your character to build a resilient character by being outside in the elements and i don't think there's any better way of doing that than you know than either exercising outside but even better exercising outside with mates and i'm not talking about going for a 10 mile beast thing i'm talking about going for a walk and a talk and again this all comes back to the the basics of what we talked about uh, you know a couple of minutes ago about belonging so so for me it's you know someone who wants to get started in it is is just find something that you're interested in passionate about and then go and do it i agree with you 100 percent. and you know when we first met i remember we we had a few drams and then the next day it was like we, we actually stayed in Allendale where they had a gym downstairs and I made the stupid mistake of saying oh let's go for a workout together a little bit of uh, excessive brand loyalty in the gym doesn't <laughs> didn't go down too <laughs> we, well you know what I mean but so and, and you know on that point like you're obviously very physical you, you work out a lot now I remember someone saying to me that your mind will give up way before your body does do you agree with that statement you can literally run your body until it until it physically breaks, until you break bones, snap tendons and, and ligaments. But usually your mind gives up well in advance of that. And your mind can be, you know, it's it's for for something that's that's you know only what 20% of your body weight or something like that. It uses so much energy to keep it going and to keep it positive and to keep it um to keep it working optimally the way it should do. Yeah, I, I mean it's it's you know, people say mind over matter or whatever, but you know, ultimately, your your brain is incredibly powerful, and it's it's the difference between winning, losing, setting records, breaking records, or even just getting out of the house in the morning. That's why, for me, like it's critical. Like you've got all these basics about how to be or how to optimize yourself as a human being, which is sleep, nutrition, and then your sort of social network right they, they're like fundamentals and i think that if you're you know if you're not staying on top of all of that then it's quite easy for your your mind to give up and certainly you know the work that i do in expeditions you you my brain is my or my ability to read a situation to make decisions under pressure unoptimized no sleep tired scared wet cold that that to me is the most powerful bit of kit that I can take with me on an expedition, on a trip, and, you know, more than a knife, more than all of the bits and pieces of kit that people will say is their favorite rucksack or this thing or that thing. For me, it's, it's a brain that works when it's addled by lack of sleep and, and fear, probably. In addition to your adventures, you also kind of look at, you know, you're involved in conservation efforts, right, and raising awareness on environmental issues. Let's chat about that a little bit. How do you incorporate that into your expeditions and what you do? When I first started doing expeditions, it was, you know, I was younger and it was much more about testing myself in that environment and to see I suppose physically, you know, could I carry this weight that distance? Can I climb that mountain? You know, can I stay in this bunker or that cave on my own for how many days? And it was about challenging myself. And and I would say now in the last six or seven years, most of the expeditions and trips I've been doing have been, have had much more depth. And they, you know, although we're still having adventures and we're still climbing say for example first ascents of big cliffs somewhere or, or diving you know first descents in in subs to new areas that have never been explored in the seabed you know all, all of these 
I guess all, all of these things are, you know, tricky to do, but they but they're also telling a story that is about conservation. It's about the environment. It's about changing weather. It's about people changing. It's about technology changing. And you can you kind of can't really avoid it now. So, for example, we filmed two years ago. It's on Disney now. A big series with Alex Honnold and Hazel Finley called Arctic Ascent. And it was, you know, at the heart of it is an adventure show. We were climbing big walls that had never been climbed before and skiing across ice caps that have never been explored or skied across. But in the process of us doing all of that, we were collecting data for universities, for NASA, for for other organizations. And and I think that's now sort of comes hand in hand with the with the territory. It's like we're going to this place to do this thing. Does anyone need any data collected from here? So you're you're effectively trying to become part of the solution or data gathering process instead of just part of the problem. So you know it's it's been much more the the series that's coming out this summer on Disney and Nat Geo Ocean Explorers. That's also it's the same. You know at the heart it's James Cameron adventure series of exploring the oceans. But really, it's it's about the people that are trying to protect the oceans. It's about the animals that are struggling. It's about the the water systems, the sea systems, the ocean systems that are changing and what that means for people. And it's really to get people motivated and interested in the ocean, in, you know, the various different environments. So, you know, and we can have a good reach. You know, if you, if you have a show that goes out on... Disney or one of the big streamers, you know, millions of people can see it. And it just takes one or two people to see it to then go, actually, I want to help instead of being a part of the problem. I'm going to study marine biology. I'm going to study oceanography. I'm going to become an, an engineer that, that is going to work on getting subs further, deeper, more commercial. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's much more a bit. It's a bigger part of what we do now, for sure. That's very cool and very cool to hear. And is I suppose I've just thought of this question. I wasn't going to ask you it, but I'm going to going to chuck this one on you. Has there ever been a point where you've had a brief land on your desk? Like I know you've chatted to me about some crazy stories, like speaking to drug cartels in Mexico and you know all that kind of crap. Have you ever had anything land on your desk and go, "No, fuck this. I'm not doing that. That is just too crazy. Like I'm not interested." I haven't, but I would now, having done one of those jobs that I should have said no to. And it really, was, uh, so it was like half halfway through. You're like, I shouldn't have taken this one on. Uh, yeah, yeah. Foxy and I went down to South America, and we spent three months down there in Colombia, Peru, and Mexico, basically following the cocaine trade from you know the farmers growing it in Peru all the way up to it being distributed from Mexico, and we were with essentially worth the bad guys for all of it. And it, it just, it was just incredibly hectic. There was no real, there was no real safety there or, you know, Fox and I were essentially on our own and basically dealing with, with some really heavy, nasty stuff. And I think looking back on it, it was a bit foolhardy when we did it. It's cool because we got out the other side of it, but if that brief landed now, then I would definitely say no. Yeah, and that and that's the, that, for that. Yeah, no, absolutely, mate. And and that's the that's on because I, I watched that. It's, it's on Netflix, right? You talk about Jason Netflix. Fox when you say Foxy, yeah, yeah. What's it called? Yeah, again, yeah. Is it? It's the real narcos drug, or? drug lords inside the real narcos. Yeah, yeah. I think it's on Netflix. But yeah, yeah it's, it's it's. I haven't watched it since we did it because it's just so. It was. I, I found it quite hectic. Too um, harrowing. You know when it. Yeah, when you're working with like wild animals are you i don't i've worked on quite a lot of anti-poaching stuff where you're, you're sort of out on foot patrols and there's wild animals and all of that stuff is manageable but dealing with people that are that are you know massive egos coked out their eyeballs and carrying weapons around with them is is quite tricky to say the least <laughs> yeah, too, too, too many variables right exactly yeah is, are you are you talking about glasgow on a saturday night here <laughs> I don't um, get lynched. 
So, well, let me ask you this, mate. I, you know, as you're exploring all these new frontiers, and there's probably not much that you haven't done now within the world, I'd say. But is there anything that's still on your bucket list that you you you're gonna do? Well, I, d- I did a big one last year, and it was I climbed Everest in Lhotse, and that was you know I'd I'd wanted to do it since I was a kid. You know, I went to see a talk by Chris Bornington, I think, when I was a kid, and I was like blown away by that high altitude mountaineering. So I climbed that last year and it was, you know, personally, it was amazing. It was, it was very different to the other expeditions that I do normally because it was a commercial one, but it was amazing. Like loved it. But I think there's a few places I've not been. I'm looking at a world map now. So I've got no pins in, in Antarctica. I've got no pins in Patagonia and I've got no pins in Alaska. So there, there are three places that I'd, I'd love to go to, but I, it's funny to answer your question. I, I basically, I've got a son who's three and another one who's arriving imminently, like any week. And actually, I'm, I'm sort of looking at back into the UK, doing some, doing some cool things that I did when I was a kid, like paddling the the Great Glen, or, or you're basically just spending for me spending time in Scotland with them, doing the things I did when I was a kid. So it's, it's my, I want to get the canoe out again with with Atlas and the next one. I have to wait a couple of years, and uh, and then get them up into the mountains in Scotland and and just basically adventure locally for a while. Brilliant. Well, give me a shout when you want to paddle the Great Glen, mate. I've done that a couple of times. So, oh well, yeah, I did. <laughs> that sounded harrowing. <laughs> there you go. I yeah, That's... I would. I would. It's like that Patagonia and Antarctica is on my on my list. I keep seeming to going back to really hot, sweaty, jungly places. I could do with a cold one coming up soon. Mate, I I saw your uh, I saw your Instagram last week about you being in that jungle. It looked hot as balls. Hot as hell. Yeah, I'm getting hotter. So let's finish off with some whiskey chat. Top Wildmore for you, which one are you going to pick out of the uh, out of the three expressions, the 23, the 30, or the 40-year-old? I really liked the 23-year-old. That was my favourite on both times that I've tasted it. And let you into a secret, I just took a bottle of it away on the last trip that I did. And it was amazing. We, we I can't tell you where I was, but when on the couple of occasions that we drank it, it was like, this is exactly what, this was meant for we had a we had a very we had a very awesome accomplishment on this trip that we just did it'll be on tv next year and it was just it just felt like such a perfect way to, to celebrate but for me the the 23 yeah for yeah. sure what about yeah. you yeah no i'm with you mate the dark moorland <clears throat> you know we i was just just in singapore and we did quite a lot of launches there we were in chang airport we did a lot of lunches a lot of tastings with it and it seemed like that was the kind of fan favorite as well. You know, a lot of the time it's the... Was it? The, yeah, yeah, the 23, the 40 goes down really well, obviously. And the 30-year-old the tends to be people that really like that smoky style of whiskey. That that takes yeah. a lot of boxes for them. I've got and, a bottle of it now that I'm going to take away on this next trip with me, so I'll be tasting that. Nice, mate. Nice. And what about, like, top whiskey moment that you've ever had? Oh, there have been many right just off the top of my head i'll give you i mean i I haven't even prepped this so this is just this is just off the top of my head summit in everest summiting lotse so the world's highest and fourth highest mountains whiskey abseiling down angel falls whiskey at the bottom exploring a cave system in venezuela that no one's ever been in whiskey moment finding forty thousand year old cave paintings in a, in a cave in Borneo, whiskey moment, uh, <laughs> doing a, a first ascent in Greenland last year when when the team basically summited on the uh, I'd actually carried a bottle all the way across the ice cap and up another big wall and up about seven days on the glacier. So it'd been we'd been on the move for about seven weeks at this point, and I had a liter of whiskey in my bag just for the one. Is in my sledge actually for the for the one moment when and if we ever got to the top of uh, of the climb, which we did. Uh and then recently when when my son was born, which was I was actually on a 
I missed them being born. I was on a ship on that James Cameron shoot and toasted them into the world. I watched him being born on WhatsApp on my phone no. from the science from the science deck, and then um, and then went immediately to the bar and had a had a whiskey. So yeah, it's uh, I where else? I remember drinking whiskey in in Iraq back in the day, and then I just had. The most recent one was the Wildmore 23, and that was just last week. A very, very cool situation in a very cool place. I can't tell you. That you can't talk about I can tell you, but you I can tell to... you, but after this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could tell me, but then it's going to be a pain in the ass for the edit, so don't. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and then, obviously, you missed the, the, the biggest one, mate, having, having Wildmore with me. Yes, I mean that's that's up there. That's up there. Actually, do you know what? I I learned so much because that like I've had whiskey all through my life that punctuates very cool things, but I've never been I don't know too much more about it other than you know what I really like and what I don't like, you know, so it was it was cool spending time with you and hanging out and being able to get a bit more of a, a vibe and Brian obviously as well. Yeah. Yeah. And to get more of an insight into like what goes into it, yeah, uh, well, which I found I, brilliant. And I suppose you've got that now. You know, to your point, when you take it away with you, you've now got stories that are not just adventure related, but also whiskey related. With with hanging out with myself and Brian, I mean, I made it all up, mate. So you know, don't take too much out of that. But... <laughs> I haven't told anyone any of the stuff you told me, so just in case. <laughs> <laughs> but although it's been a pleasure um, hanging with you, uh, you guys might have noticed that Nicholas hasn't been asking any questions. He had to run off. Aldo, amazing to see you, man. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're a busy, busy guy. So we really appreciate you coming on the show, hanging out with us. And I'm looking forward to doing it when you get back up to Scotland again, man. You need to give me a shout and get yes. some drums up here again. 100%. And I'll let you know how we get on with the uh, Wildmore 30, which is coming away on this next trip. But thank you for having me on, dude. Appreciate that. Pleasure, man, and good luck with the uh, the new trip coming up. Thank you, mate. Cheers, then. <laughs>